Okay, so this is part two of our current event weekly Bible study for October 28th, 2007. And again, this part two is in reference to the zeitgeist. I don't know how many parts this is going to take me to get through, but um, where we had uh, left off, we're going to continue in regard to this film. The film next then states that a star in the east announced the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh announced his birth, and that three kings came to bring gifts to the Savior. Okay, now I'm sorry, this is in reference to Horus. This is what they're saying was Horus's life, okay? In, in other words, what they're trying to do is say that all this whole, all the accounts about Jesus Christ, all they were, were repackaged Horus uh, teachings, okay? Which, again, we're going to debunk this. It, it's easily debunked. But the film, the zeitgeist, states that a star in the east announced Horus' birth and that three kings came to bring gifts to the, quote, Savior. However, when stories detailing the birth of Horus are examined, there is no star or three kings who come to visit him. Trying to link this to Christianity fails in any event as the account of Christ's birth in Matthew has magi, or wise men, not kings, coming to Jesus with their actual number not being stated. Finally, the movie calls Horus a savior. There are no descriptions of Horus being a savior to anyone or serving in that capacity at all, even in paganism. This is an, this is an important point. The movie takes the extreme, unsubstantiated liberty in the quick and subtle uses of Christian words and phrases that in no way accurately describe the actual pagan god or attribute being discussed. And again, they couldn't even get their paganism right in this movie. In this movie. This is seen again in the statements made of Horus being baptized and starting a ministry. The only accounts remotely related to Horus and water are stories told about Osiris, his father, who is sometimes combined in ancient accounts with Horus to form one individual whose body was cut up into 14 pieces by his enemy set, scattered throughout the earth. Isis then supposedly found each body part, except the phallus, and became the lord of the underworld. Oh, that, that story really parallels Jesus. Yeah, right. I mean, give me a break. Depending on which account is read, because there's other versions of this account, none of them come close to the account of Jesus Christ, though. In any event, stating that Horus was baptized is simply playing fast and loose with Christian terminology. In addition, Horus had no ministry. Horus becoming a teacher at the age of 12, mimicking Jesus' account at the temple as a youth is nowhere to be found in the account of Horus. Neither are there any statements to the effect of him having twelve disciples. According to Horus accounts, Horus had four semi-gods that were followers and, and some indications of sixteen human followers, and an unknown number of blacksmiths that went with him into battle. No accounts of Horus being betrayed are found in his portrayals, like Jesus Christ was. And he certainly did not die by crucifixion on any account. There is an incident described in one story of Horus being torn to pieces with Isis requesting that the crocodile godfish fish him out of the water he was placed. Crocodile god fish him out of the water he was placed into. But the movie does not mention this as it does not fit their agenda. And that's what this movie is about, an agenda. The, the first 37 minutes to try to totally discredit any semblance of Christianity. Further, the movie puts the account of Horus as originating around 3000 BC, which predates the invention and the practice of the crucifixion. So there is another historical problem that must be overcome. It's pure lies. The first 37 minutes are pure lies in this movie. They don't even get their paganism right. The claims of Horus being buried for three days and resurrected are not to be found in any of the ancient Egyptian texts either. Now, we're going to look at this further. Okay, I'm giving a cursory view here. We're going to look at this further. Some accounts have Osiris being brought back to life by Isis and going to be the lord of the underworld. But there is not an account of Horus being in the grave for three days and then being resurrected. Or Horus physically coming out of the grave in the same physical body he went in with and never dying again. There's no account of this. And there's certainly no account of Horus dying for the sins of others as Jesus Christ did. In the end, the attempt to prove Horus was a picture 
or forerunner of Jesus simply fails from lack of historical evidence. The movie continues in the same vein that all the other mythological pagan deities that predated Jesus Christ, like Atias and Krishna, etc., as just another simple example that the Zeitgeist movie says that the Hindus Krishna was also crucified and resurrected. Um, however, Hindu teachings clearly state that Krishna was killed by an arrow shot from a hunter who accidentally kill, hit him in his heel after he died. Well, that sounds like a repackaged Achilles to me. He was hit in the heel and then he died? Well, you ever heard the Achilles heel? Paganism borrows from paganism. Jesus Christ doesn't borrow for any, from any of it. None of the pagan deities, when accurately examined, mirror the Son of God recorded in the, New, in the New Testament Gospels. Of course, neither does the movie note these following facts that, that we're about to mention now. The many archaeological details confirming the New Testament accounts, because they're basically saying in the movie, Jesus never even existed. Okay, The historically confirmed references that run alongside the life of Christ, the early dating of the Gospel accounts during the lifetime of eyewitnesses, the deep moral convictions of the authors and their commitment to the truth, so much so that they were willing to die for their faith, like virtually all the apostles did. The accounts of the apostles going to their deaths for what they'd seen in regard to Jesus Christ, the typology of Jesus and Joseph used by the film to supposedly debunk the actual existence of Christ. Now, this I thought was really amazing when they started using Joseph and saying that Jesus Christ just copycat of Joseph. Joseph was a type of Christ. This is a way that actually Scripture was confirmed. There's many types of Christ in the Old Testament that shed light and point to Jesus Christ the Savior. But that doesn't discredit Christ. That confirms Christ. But this movie had the audacity to basically act like, oh no, this just proves that it's all false. Like the Bible says, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Their, their, their logic is so flawed. And again, we're going to go into all this further. It is very well known and accepted by conservative Christian scholars that this Joseph being a type of Christ was a foreshadowing of the first coming of Jesus Christ. It's not anything I'm going to be ashamed about as a Christian for sure. It's something that, the, that I can point to as the Bible to actually confirm my faith. Not, not weaken it. Um, also, they don't mention all the good produced by Christianity. And I mean true Bible-believing Christianity. I don't mean Roman Catholicism here. There's a book written by a guy named Alvin Schmidt on, it's called How Christianity Changed the World by Dr. Alvin Schmidt that they reference here. All the good that produced by Christianity are totally brushed aside. The only thing that, that they mention in the Zeitgeist movie are things like the Crusades and, and the, um, uh, the Catholic slaughter of all these millions of people during the Inquisition. And other events like this are highlighted. And again, they're totally acting as though the Catholic Church is the Christian Church. And it's not. It's the farthest thing from it. You know, during the Inquisition, the people, most of the people that were being killed during the Inquisition were true Bible-believing Christians. And the reason they were being killed is because they were true Bible-believing Christians. See, there's a whole different line of Christians that, that were, again, the narrow path... There's few that be that find it, but there's a whole other line of Christians that came up from Antioch, where they were first called Christians, in Acts, that were the true born-again Christians. The Waldensians, the Lombards, the Anabaptists, these type of people. This is where I trace my lineage to. Okay, as far as looking back. There's a, there's a really good book written by a guy named Dr. Phil Stringer. It's called The Faithful Baptist Witness. Now, I don't believe it's so much as a matter of Baptist, a Baptist issue. Okay, at all. But the book does a very good job of documenting this separate line of people that came up. And you realize if you call yourself a Protestant, that means that you're basically saying that I came out of the Catholic Church. Because Protestants came out of the Protestant Reformation. They were protesting what was going on in the Catholic Church. Ultimately, and firstly, through Martin Luther. With the 95 Thesis thing nailed on the church door. Okay, that was how that all started. I don't, I don't associate myself with that. Okay, I don't. But most denominations in, to, in today's day and age that are that are call themselves Christian associate themselves with that. Call themselves Protestants. I don't call myself that. I call myself a Bible-believing Christian. Okay, born-again Bible-believing Christian. 
I don't put a denominational label on it. So, if we go further, um, in, in, in debunking this movie, this 